I want to welcome all of you who came this evening. Um, we're very happy to see you all. I want to welcome our special guest this evening, outside of Sharon Heber, who's going to speak to us, the new Ambassador of Palestine, His Excellency uh, Dr. Abdel Shafi. I'm very glad. Okay, Mr. Abdel Shafi. I'm very glad that you took the time to be with us this evening. Mm -hmm. Really, very glad. I just say a few in the introductory words. I don't want to talk too long because we have a very, very interesting lecture this evening. But I will say a few words for those who don't know about women in black. My name is Paula Abrams Hurani, and I was one of the founders of the group here in Vienna in June 2001. We're a human rights initiative and have held vigils constantly since June 2001, at least once a month for two hours on the Graben and sometimes more frequently when there were special reasons to inform the public about what's happening. Our group has tried to explain the roots of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict what the Israeli occupation means for those who are living under occupation, the Palestinians. You can find some of our flyers on the information table. In addition, we have protested the war against Iraq, <coughs> Afghanistan, the U.S. veto in the Security Council on settlements, and more recently we held a vigil um, against the military intervention in Syria. Our group, the Women in Black Movement, is a movement against militarism and racism and for justice, and it exists in many countries. I would like to thank the Afroasiatic Institute for giving us the use of this room for the evening. It is not the first time we have received help from the Institute. Thanks also to Oliver from Dar al Janoub for filming this evening for us. Um, we hope that it will be going on YouTube, we're not sure. We have difficulty in Vienna publicizing uh, talks, difficulty with the media. And there was, some, was a request from Linz, and I'm hoping then that this, these people can see the lecture and hear the lecture. I would like just to make some announcements before we begin. We have flyers on the information table with announcements of a number of important coming events which are to take place in Vienna. Um, on the 9th of November, an evening in the Odeon Theater, on the occasion of the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people, um, held under the auspices of the Palestinian Austrian Society and Palestinian doctors and pharmacists. Um, His Excellency will be there speaking introductory words and we will have a discussion between Knesset representative Mohammed Barake and Kasper Einem, which will be moderated by Karim Kneisel. And there will be a Palestinian theater and dance company from London, Al Zituna, who will perform Unto the Breach, a work based on the Near East conflict. On the 15th of November, a film evening from Dar al Janoub, Roadmap to Apartheid. On the 21st of November, we, Women in Black, who made an extensive and exhausting tour through the West Bank, will report on our journey at Amalik House. This is the 21st of November. On the 22nd, again at Dar al Janoub, the film Sons of al -Abun. On the 23rd, a discussion at the Albert Schweitzer House with Mark Ellis, Marta Tonson, Mustafa Abu Sway, Josef Windischer and Udo Bachmeier, Religion Hindernis within Frieden, Oda. And I'm very proud to say that uh, Women in Black will bring a very important new film called The Lab, which is touring through Germany. And we are bringing this film to Vienna. It will be shown at the depot in the presence of the film ma uh, maker, Jotam Feldmann. And we're hoping for a good audience. I may say, if you're not already on our mailing list, please sign your name and email address so that we can inform you 
We have a website so that you can see what Veranstaltungen, which events are taking place. We are totally independent, which means we are totally self-supporting. And as such, we are very grateful for donations so that we can continue our work, our vigils, and evenings such as this. There is a donation box on the table, and we hope for some, do for some donations uh, so that we can have more evenings such as this one. It gives me very great pleasure to introduce our guest this evening, Shir Heather, who is an economic researcher in the Alternative Information Center, a Palestinian-Israeli organization which has been active in Jerusalem and Beit Zahur for 40 years. Is that correct? No, not 40. Oh, I mean, 86. 86. Sorry. Okay. Same thing. <laughs> He is an expert in researching the economic aspect, aspects of the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territories and is the author of the book, The Political Economy of Israel's Occupation, Repression Beyond, Beyond Exploitation. This book is for sale on the table. About this book, Jeff Halper, director of the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions, wrote, Shir Heber has emerged as one of the most incisive analysts of the critical Israeli left. A truly engaged intellectual, Heber straddles the academic activist divide. Heber leads us through a detailed study of the economy of the occupation with a clarity of style and a mastery of the issues which contribute immeasurably to both broadening and sharpening our views. It is this kind of book which upon which effective political action depend, depends. I personally am very impressed with Sher Heber's courage and modesty in fearlessly speaking out on controversial subjects. This is sadly not at all common in our society and should be honored. We are very fortunate that Sher is currently con completing his doctorate in Germany, and so we were thus able to invite him to speak in Vienna. His topic this evening is indeed an important, very timely one. Without further ado, please, please let us welcome Sheer Heber. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you all very much for coming. Thank you very much for uh, Women in Black for inviting me. And for the very uh, warm and uh, uh, embarrassing compliment. Uh, I will uh, speak English, and if I'm speaking too fast, if something is not clear, please hold your hands. I will repeat myself, speak slower, try to say something in German uh, to make it a bit easier. Um, and um, I would like to talk today about the military industry in Israel, the, the weapons industry, and the arms trade, uh, the Israeli arms trade. Uh, and this is an economic topic. I'm going to talk about it mostly from the economic side of it and the political side, and not so much from the military strategy side, which I'm not an expert on. Um, and I don't know what you already know about this topic, if you already have some knowledge, so I will try to speak for about one hour, give you uh, an overview in, about, in, in six chapters, and then uh, we can uh, open for discussion, and you can ask me questions, and I hope we'll have time to answer as many questions as possible, so that I will be able to address those questions that are more interesting for you, and not just what I imagine that will be interesting for you. Um, so I'd like to start uh, with a chronological overview, uh, very quickly, to try to uh, talk about how the Israeli military industry has developed. And I would uh, say the starting point is 1933. This year, uh, the Israeli military industries, it's the name of a company, was founded and started to produce weapons for the Israeli paramilitary, not even Israeli, Jewish paramilitary forces that operated in Palestine, um, mainly the Haganah. Uh, and these organizations, which I, I think today we will call them terrorist organizations, uh, produced uh, immediately these weapons uh, that were produced in secret uh, uh, and hidden. And this uh, uh, company was, was uh, not really operating as a company, it was operating as a service or as a, a national uh, initiative. Uh, and it, was later be uh, uh, it has later become a branch of the Israeli government. 
Uh, many years uh, later, when Israel was already a state, it became a state-owned company. It is still today a state-owned company, but today the Israeli government is in the last stages of privatizing this company, selling it. I think in many ways, if we start in 1933 with this Israeli military industries and, and see how uh, uh, the Israeli government came to decide that this government should actually be owned by private individuals, uh, then we can learn quite a lot about, what, about the development of the Israeli military industries. It should be also noted that four years after uh, uh, IMI, the Israeli military industries, was founded, uh, ELOP was founded as well. ELOP uh, was founded as a private company, for profit, and was the first Jewish owned military company in Palestine in 1937. Um, so we have these two sides, the state owned or government owned or even before the state existed, a sort of uh, a co a collectively owned uh, military industry and the private military industry that developed side by side. And what started is a very clear advantage to the state owned, to the national projects, uh, which were intended mainly to provide arms for the Jewish forces, later for the Israeli forces, has over time changed into part of the global arms industry, for-profit companies uh, and privatized companies. A very important date that we should also uh, talk about is 1967. Uh, not just because that was uh, the date in which Israel expanded its borders by 40% and occupied the Palestinian West Bank, Gaza Strip, the uh, uh, Syrian uh, Golan Heights, and uh, the Egyptian Sinai Peninsula, but also because it uh, was a key moment in the history of a very deep debate within the Israeli arms sector between two opposing schools of thought. These two schools of thought have emerged after 1948, uh, and they had uh, different opinions. Th th those are both schools of, of thought which are part of the Israeli government, which are very high-ranking individuals in the Israeli government w uh, and, and the army. One of them was the school of thought that called for specialization, and the other one was the school of thought that called for self-sufficiency. <coughs> um, okay, just a moment. Remember that I should turn on the recording. Sorry. Yeah. So, sorry. I was talking about uh, uh, two schools of thought, one for uh, specialization and one for self-sufficiency. Uh, the school of thought that called for uh, self-sufficiency uh, had uh, many very senior uh, people in the Israeli government and army, including Shimon Peres, which, was, which is still in Israeli politics today. Um, and they argued that the first purpose or the first goal of the Israeli arms industry is to provide weapons that the Israeli army needs, that Israel can never be certain that it will be able to import weapons uh, and other uh, machinery uh, for its army from, from outside. So all of the needs have to be provided for locally. This means that if the Israeli army needs more guns, the Israeli industry should produce more guns. Uh, and the other school of thought, the one calling for specialization, had also very famous people, including, for example, Yitzhak Rabin, also a famous uh, figure, although he's no longer alive. And uh, this school of thought called, uh, said, said that there is no way for the Israeli industry to provide everything that the army needs. They should actually focus on what they're good at. So if they're already good at pro producing certain products, they should focus on these products. And the other products they should import from other countries. This was an argument. In 1967, when Israel uh, occupied uh, all this land that I mentioned, uh, the, their main arms provider, which was France, uh, decided to impose an arms embargo on Israel. And the Israeli government um, had to choose if they prefer to keep the occupied territory or if they uh, want to keep their most uh, important source of weapons, and they chose the territory. Uh, and that was a moment in which the school of thought calling for self-sufficiency has won the argument for, for the time being, meaning that they realize they will have to produce things for themselves. In that, in that year, also the private market reacted and a new company was founded called Elbit Systems. Elbit Systems is now the most famous Israeli weapons industry, the second biggest 
women's industry in Israel, and I will talk about this company more. Uh, but it is also clear that, in, that private investors saw the occupation as a business opportunity. They understood that the Israeli government is going to need a lot of weapons. They will not be able to buy these weapons from France, so they will need to buy them from another source. And at the same time, the Israeli uh, government instructed the local uh, uh, arms industry, which was mostly state-owned, the state-owned companies and the state-owned factories, to start to produce everything. So they started to try to make tanks and uh, warships and airplanes, everything that the Israeli army would need, and they were not very successful. Uh, but the interesting thing is that this decision of the government to take the side of the school of thought calling for self-sufficiency has turned out to be wrong because of what we know happened in 1973, six years later. In the middle of the war, uh, uh, of the October War in 1973, uh, the United States uh, increased its aid to Israel. And I'm going to talk more about the aid that the United States gave to Israel, one of the most important uh, milestones in the history of the Israeli arms industry. And that decision of the United States to provide Israel with military aid has completely switched the, the, the direction, and now the school of thought calling for specialization has won the argument. Not only because now there was no shortage of weapons that the Israeli army could buy from the United States, or actually receive, re receive them for free, uh, but also because the United States put re restrictions on the Israeli industry and prevented uh, the Israeli industry from uh, pro uh, developing projects that would compete with, this, with the United States arms industry. The most uh, famous example is the um, fighter plane Lavi. This was a fighter plane that was developed by the Israeli arms industry uh, in the 1980s. And uh, the Israeli uh, uh, Aerospace uh, Industries, uh, IAI, uh, then it was called Israeli Air uh, Industries, uh, <coughs> Air Force Industries. Uh, they, did, they decided to have their own fighter plane that would be even better, so they said, than the F-16. But, uh, of course, the United States didn't like that very much and it put a lot of pressure. The project was eventually cancelled after it cost a lot of billions of dollars. Uh, so, 1973 is the point where Israel realized that even though they chose to continue the uh, occupation, the military occupation, of, of the land uh, uh, that they conquered in 1967 and continued um, to break international law, to violate ina international law in many ways. I'm not going to go into the details because I assume you know. But if you don't know, then I will go into details. Um, but, but rather than, de than being punished and being put under an arms embargo, the opposite has happened. Israel received more military support than any other country in the world. There is no other country in the world until today that receives more military aid than Israel. From the United States or, or in general. Um, now the 80s and the 90s are also an important period of time because with the end of the Cold War, uh, there was a reduction in the uh, global expenditure on arms and on, on defense budgets in general. And this has affected the Israeli arms industry as well. Uh, and it also, uh, in Israel, especially during the 90s, with the Oslo process and international investment pouring into Israel, there, was, there were new sectors emerging in the Israeli economy, and the arms industry has started to lag behind. Uh, it has lost its position of prominence that it got in the 70s, and there were uh, increasing talks and criticism inside the Israeli public saying, that these, government, these companies are not very profitable, are not very efficient, maybe they should be privatized. This is what we see in the 80s and 90s. But in the, in the turn of the, of the millennium, starting from, from the year 2000, and especially starting from 2001, the September 11 attacks on the United States, there is a renewal of the Israeli arms industry. But what I would like to argue today is that this renewal, this new kind of arms industry that has and started to grow very rapidly in the last 10 years uh, in Israel is actually quite different than the arms industry that existed before. It is a very specialized kind of arms industry and it is something that uh, it tells us a great deal 
about the story of the occupation, of the colonization of Palestine by Israel, uh, and also about the relation between uh, the apartheid uh, policies employed by the Israeli government and uh, the occupation. So, I want to talk a little bit about the U.S. aid, aid from the United States. On average, the United States gives Israel $3 billion, billion dollars, every year. But this is actually not money that goes into uh, the, Israeli, uh, the, the Israeli society or the pockets of Israelis. It is actually not money. It is vouchers that it, the Israeli government is obligated to use in order to buy weapons from the United States. And when you understand that, then suddenly it becomes quite clear why the United States gives Israel this aid as well. Because it is not because uh, the, the US government is particularly Zionist. It is because the US government wants to give a subsidy to the, to the weapons industry in the United States. And this aid has shaped the relations between Israel and the United States in the past 40 years. And has, uh, although there was aid before 1973, it was very small, uh, it was increased dramatically in 1973. It has uh, created also a dependency inside Israel because all these American weapons that go into Israel are used by Israel in regional wars, in attacks, uh, and uh, in, in uh, fights. Something which is also good for the U.S. arms industry. Not, not so good for peace in the Middle East, but good for the arms industry. And creates profits for these companies. Uh, and so, uh, what, it, what has happened is that today Israel is spending more money, of taxpayer money of Israeli citizens, on buying even more weapons from the United States than those three billion dollars that they get for free. Over the years, the aid from the United States to Israel has remained mostly constant, around three billion dollars. And it started with 1.8 billion dollars in military aid and 1.2 billion dollars in civilian aid. So Israel was also able to use some of the aid to buy things or, or to, to get gifts from the United States, uh, such as uh, uh, food and clothes. They usually actually uh, ask for military uh, uh, rations, combat rations and uniforms, rather than food and clothes for the civilian population. Mm -hmm. But in 1996, uh, Netanyahu, who just became uh, Prime Minister, went to Washington and told the Congress that he would like the United States to convert those 1.2 billion dollars into also into our, a, a, a military aid, and that Israel is willing to take a two for one ratio for every two dollars of civilian aid, one dollar of military aid. So the U.S. Congress approved of that plan, and over the years the aid has changed from civilian to military. But they didn't do it for two for one; they, they increased the aid so that it remained about three billion dollars. So you can see that. Over the years, Israel needed more and more weapons. You can also see that three billion dollars in 1973 is not three billion dollars today. The dollar is not as strong as it was, and the Israeli economy is not as big as it was. I mean, it's much bigger. And uh, so that means uh, that if in 1973 this was the most important aspect of the Israeli economy, the fact that they were receiving aid from the United States, today that's not exactly the case. Uh, and of course, this aid comes with strings attached. The, United, the, the, the U.S. Uh, tried to give Israel specifically certain systems and not others. Especially those systems like missiles that uh, the Israeli arms industry itself was working on. Israel was, uh, Israeli companies were developing anti-tank missiles, so the United States gave the Israeli army anti-tank missiles. This was a direct financial attack or, or economic attack on the Israeli arms companies that were developing this. And the Israeli arms companies adjusted by changing their focus. They abandoned projects like those anti-tank uh, missiles or like the Lavi fighter plane that I uh, described before, and instead started to work on components that were going to work with US-made systems. So if you look at the websites of the Israeli uh, uh, weapon uh, companies today and you want to see what they are producing, you see that they are mainly producing optical systems, navigation systems, targeting systems, and these systems are designed so that they will work with a US tank or with a US fighter plane or a bomber. To, so that 
uh, they, they work together. And it, it is in order, of course, not to come into direct competition with these companies. Um, and, and of course that uh, also works very well for the US uh, industries, and it has actually worked so well inside Israel that uh, these companies have uh, expanded their uh, sales very much and uh, have uh, become very successful in convincing uh, countries that buy weapons from the United States to also buy weapons from Israel. One last thing I want to say about the US uh, aid is uh, how we can see through the US aid uh, the whole issue of uh, the political relations between the United States and Israel in a completely different light. Because I'm sure that all of you have heard about this uh, myth that the uh, pro-Israeli lobby uh, controls Washington from behind the scenes. You've heard about IPAC, I guess. IPAC is the name of this uh, pro-Israeli lobby. And um, this is, uh, this, uh, unfortunately, is sometimes used by uh, anti-Semitic uh, um, people to, to try to create a kind of image as if this, uh, there is a secret uh, community, uh, a secret committee of uh, uh, Zionist Jews who control the U.S. government from behind the scenes. It sometimes even looks strange that we see U.S. senior politicians uh, uh, speaking with IPAC, giving talks to IPAC, which seem to be uh, extremely uh, submissive or, or extremely flattering to IPAC. When uh, uh, Obama was uh, uh, running for president uh, uh, for the first time, he went to IPAC and said, that uh, Israel is uh, the will, will always be the United Capital of uh, uh, Jerusalem will always be the United Capital of Israel, which is a statement that contradicts the U.S. foreign policy, official foreign policy about uh, occupation. Um, but why why did he need to do this? Is it because there are so many Jewish voters in the United States that are Zionist and would only vote for him if he makes such a, uh, such a statement? Is it because really the Jews control the banks and they have all this money to support them? Of course not. I think we can learn a lot by looking at the weapon uh, uh, industries and look at the lobby of the weapon industries. The big weapon industries in the United States, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, McDonnell Douglas, these companies, each one of them, has a lobby at least 10 times bigger and stronger than IPAC. At least 10 times bigger in terms of money than IPAC. These companies are trying to lobby the government to continue create an environment in which weapons will sell a lot and for high prices. But I don't think you can uh, uh, you will see a, a candidate for the U.S. presidency going to the Congress and saying uh, going to to the lobby of of Lockheed Martin and saying, "Don't worry, we will make sure there will be no peace in the Middle East in the next uh, ten years, so your profits will be high." Of course, they cannot say that. But if they say to IPAC, we will always support Israel no matter what. The message is the same. And Lockheed Martin, McDonnell Douglas, Boeing, they understand that as long as the United States continues to support Israel's policies of occupation and, and conflict and war in the Middle East, there's going to be sales uh, of these weapons. And Henry Kissinger, the former uh, Secretary of State of the United States, said that for every tank that the United States gives to Israel for free, the neighbors of Israel buy four tanks from the United States. <laughs> so this is something about the U.S. aid, and I think it puts things a little bit in perspective. But I want to talk about, about the whole idea of exports, because the fact that there is a weapons industry in Israel doesn't necessarily mean that Israel will be exporting its weapons. Uh, in fact, uh, the, uh, after all, weapon exports means that you are providing weapons to somebody else, and it requires a certain amount of tr uh, trust. Uh, it, there have been many, many cases in which uh, Israeli forces or Israeli uh, soldiers were attacked by weapons that were actually sold by the Israeli arms industry itself. Uh, the most famous case was in 2006, when a group of Israeli soldiers in uh, an occupied part of southern Lebanon uh, have been attacked by the Hezbollah and taken captive. Later it was found out that they were killed. But the Hezbollah soldiers uh, that uh, attacked, that ambushed Israeli soldiers and, and took their, uh, them alive or dead uh, from the scene have left behind a machine gun that had a, an Israeli military serial number on it. So it had, this machine gun was sold by the Israeli army to Iran and then found its way to the Hezbollah. 
Um, Iran was one of Israel's big trading partners for, for weapons for many years, even after the revolution. But, uh, uh, so why is Israel selling weapons? Uh, first of all, uh, the idea that Israel will sell weapons have, has developed uh, in, the, in the early years of Israel only as a way to make some money in order to finance weapon development. So the idea was that um, the army will sell excess weapons, old weapons that they don't know, no longer need, in order to get some money so that they can develop better weapons for the future. But over time it has developed into becoming also a kind of pressure valve. So there is a weapon company like Rafael, for example. Rafael is a big uh, government-owned uh, weapon company producing drones, producing um, um, armor and things like that. And this company regularly sells components to the Israeli army. But what happens if the Israeli army decides in a certain year not to buy these components because they have enough armor for their tanks and they want to buy missiles, not from Rafael. But then the problem is that Rafael suddenly has a problem, too many workers, too, many product, too much production, and the government doesn't want these workers to be laid off, to be fired. They, next year, maybe they will want to buy weapons from them again. So the government allows these companies, during times where they uh, don't have enough to sell to the Israeli government, to sell to the rest of the world. Israel is not the biggest exporter of weapons in the world. But you can see how this uh, export has gradually increased uh, due to the connections with the United States and with the US aid, which I mentioned before. Due to the time in the 80s and 90s where uh, the Israeli um, arms industry was also in a time of, uh, of, of crisis and they needed to, to get money somehow. Uh, and it's interesting to see who were the uh, countries that bought most of the Israeli weapons. The problem is that uh, this is done in secret. It's not really possible to know how, which countries exactly Israel is selling in what components and in what years and at which amounts. But there's been some studies that uh, I've tried to go over them and collect them together, especially uh, articles which the Israeli companies themselves published in the newspapers, where they say, we just made a big a, a, a deal with some company as a way to attract investors, as a way to show that they're a, a successful and efficient company. And uh, another very interesting source is the U.S. State Department itself. They have um, their own publication about who are the biggest weapons exporters in the world and who are they exporting to. I don't think it will come to any surprise to you that number one weapons exporter in the world is the United States. Uh, in fact, the United States exports so much weapons that they export more than all of the top ten except the United States together. Okay, so it's a completely different league of, of exports from the United States. Then we have um, Russia, and we have uh, France, and we have Germany, and the UK, and then we have China, and then we have Israel. So Israel is number six, not the biggest weapons exporter in the world. But maybe it will be interesting for you to know that if you divide the total weapons export by the population, then um, you get something quite different. China, for example, becomes a very small weapons exporter. Per person, every Chinese person uh, exports weapons on average for $6 in a, a year. Uh, the United States uh, is, is one of the biggest arms exporters, also in terms of uh, per capita, per person, uh, for about $450 per year, per US citizen. They're number two in the world. Number one is Israel, with over $800 per Israeli per year in weapons export. So, it does give us an idea that somehow weapons export have, have grown very much and became a very important part of the Israeli industry, although I should say not the most important part of the Israeli industry. I will get back to this point, but the fact that every Israeli on average exports $800 worth of weapons, of course not every Israeli it works in the arms industry, I hope that's clear, but you could say that every Israeli exports more than $800 on average uh, per year in chemicals, especially fertilizers for agriculture, in diamonds, so uh, weapons is not the biggest export. 
But it is interesting to see that the customers of Israel are especially countries where there are um, uh, civil wars, extreme inequality, developing countries. Israel has always been uh, one of the most important sellers of uh, weapons to developing countries. Countries which suffer from international embargoes and respectable arms companies, if there is such a thing as a respectable arms company, I don't think there is, but uh, uh, big and famous arms companies don't really want to sell their weapons, for example, to South Africa during the days of apartheid. But, or to Rhodesia. Rhodesia also had uh, apartheid. But Israel does. Israel was the country that sold weapons to those countries especially. Israel sold weapons to Guatemala during the years of the Civil War. And, and Israel sold weapons to Chile during the times of Pinochet. Those were exactly the kind of markets that the Israeli um, image as a kind of, ro uh, as a kind of uh, young and uh, uh, rash state that is not really playing by the rules uh, and also that is not really being punished for what it does because, especially, because the United States has a special interest in supporting Israel and because Europe is paralyzed from criticizing Israel because, oh no, they will be called anti-Semites. This gives Israel the freedom to sell these uh, uh, weapons specifically to these countries. And another factor is that in Israel, every uh, Israeli officer above the rank of colonel, uh, upon uh, re uh, retiring from the army, usually will get al uh, an al almost an automatic license to trade in weapons. The reason for this is that uh, the Israeli army is relatively young. Uh, officers uh, retire from the army at the age of 40 to 45. This is, compared to most uh, armies, quite young. And the, and the government uh, wanted to keep the army young, so they wanted to allow these officers a chance to have a second career. One of the problems is that if you were a soldier all your life, you don't really have any skills that are useful in the civilian market, but one of the skills that you can market is to train army, uh, train militias or soldiers to uh, sell weapons, to uh, know how weapons work, and those are the skills that these officers could use to start up their own little company or to join an existing company. And indeed, this is, this is what happens. And what we can see, especially in the recent years, I will get back to this point uh, uh, soon uh, about the issue of homeland security, this is a very important point, but just, just to explain how this works, <coughs> when an Israeli uh, officer retires from the army, what they can do is to establish their own little uh, company and invent something invent something that they believe will, is good for security. It could be some kind of scan for the airport. Uh, it could also be uh, not just Israeli soldiers, but also Israeli police officers. Uh, some kind of security operation. It could be a school for training security guards. And then they call their unit back in the army. Their friends, because they've just retired. They still have friends in the army. And they say, will you please buy one unit from me? Uh, and their friends say, of course, why not? And then they can say, our equipment has already been tried and used by the Israeli army. This is a very important point. And, and the issue of homeland security is, is something, and I will get back to it. One last thing I just want to say about the exports is that uh, the... Yeah? Can you mention the point again? I didn't get it. Would you very important? The important point is when they can say, our equipment has been used by the Israeli army already. Mm -hmm. So if you, you have a weapons trade, or a, a trade fair, mm -hmm. in a trade fair, a, a, a thousand companies will show what they have. And uh, let's say you have a, a company selling handcuffs, uh, or selling tasers for the police. Now if you are a, a representative of a country, and you want to buy um, tasers for your police force, and you see 20 companies in the trade fair selling tasers. But one of these companies is saying, our tasers have actually been tested in human beings. In, uh, in, well, they won't say in Palestine. They say in Israel, but we know that it's in Palestine. And um, uh, then they, they say, well, I will choose this company. Their tasers are already uh, um, proven to work. Um, but this is the point I will get back to. 
But the last thing I wanted to say about the weapon exports is that the Israeli Ministry of Defense has become extremely independent as a result of the weapons export. Uh, not just, not, this is not the only result, but uh, 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 not the only reason why the Israeli Ministry of Defense is so independent. But the Israeli Ministry of Defense is not transparent. Nobody knows how their budget is distributed. And when I say nobody knows, I mean also not the Israeli Ministry of Finance. They also don't know. Uh, and they make their own decisions. They have their own custom system. So if they want to sell or buy weapons, they don't go through the normal custom system of the Israeli state, but they go through a separate custom system of the Israeli Ministry of Defense. And in fact, through the arms trade, Israel has been able to maintain <coughs> connections with countries that they don't have diplomatic relations with. The first example is Germany. Before Israel and Germany had diplomatic relations, before Israel was willing to recognize Germany as a state, there was already arms trade between the two countries. And through the arms trade, that, this is actually something the German government was very interested in because they saw it as a way to reach the Israeli government. And through the arms trade, they could have a connection with them and they could send messages. They could say, for example, we are willing to offer compensations uh, for the Holocaust in exchange for um, restarting diplomatic relations. But Germany is, is just one example. Uh, there are a lot of examples uh, in, uh, among Arab or Muslim countries, such as Indonesia, uh, Morocco, um, Tunisia, Libya. Uh, these uh, uh, countries... Uh, 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 recently there was a report by the uh, UK, by, the, uh, by Britain. Uh, Israel, of course, trades a lot of arms with Britain, and uh, according to the British law, when you buy a component from uh, uh, Britain, uh, an arms component, and you plan maybe later to sell it to another, to a third partner, you have to fill a form. Um, and the Israeli companies, uh, the, the, the Brit uh, Britain did something quite unexpected, they published the list of those countries where Israeli companies asked permission to sell these companies again, to sell these products again. <laughs> and in this list, there was Algeria and Libya and Tunisia. There was also Pakistan. And this has caused quite a bit of a stir. The Israeli government didn't uh, deny the fact that uh, it was selling weapons to Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, Indonesia, countries that it, uh, it doesn't have diplomatic relations with. But it denied very strongly that it sold weapons to Pakistan. Because the biggest customer of uh, 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 Israel, in terms of the defense industry, is India. <laughs> India is, uh, was not happy to learn that uh, Israel is selling weapons to, to Pakistan. And, and uh, yeah, the, the, the arms trade between Israel and India is quite interesting. If you want, I will, I will return to that point. But, uh, but you can see that it's a way also for the Ministry of Defense to have a little Ministry of Foreign Affairs inside it. It's a state within a state. And that's very important also to understand how the Israeli Ministry of Defense became so big, so powerful in the Israeli political system, and so non-transparent. Mm -hmm. um, well, the next point I want to uh, get to, the next uh, uh, chapter, more or less, of, of the talk, uh, is the issue of homeland security. After the attacks of September 11, uh, when uh, Netanyahu said these attacks are very good for Israel because now the world will see how important what Israel does, uh, have opened a new um, kind of, of arms trade which is known as the homeland security. Homeland security is a term, uh, uh, like I said, Israel is only number six in the world in terms of arms export, but it is the world capital of the homeland security trade. And every year there is a big trade fair in Tel Aviv where homeland security companies show what they produce. There are more than 600 homeland security companies trade, uh, registered in Israel. And of course, there are also, uh, also companies that are not traded as homeland security companies, but also have homeland security branches of, uh, of the company. And what is actually homeland security? Homeland security is uh, the idea that, um, it, 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 that is based on the fact that the Israeli army has not fought a conventional war for 40 years. And, but instead, it has a different kind of experience. It has experience in repressing 
no unarmed civilians, in controlling a population, in keeping that population uh, under constant su surveillance. Homeland security products include police equipment like uh, um, stun uh, uh, batons and, and tasers, handcuffs and leg cuffs. Uh, it includes things like security cameras that can be hidden in many ways. It includes surveillance equipment that can fly, like drones, or can swim, like uh, uh, unmanned boats. Uh, and of course, uh, security cameras mounted on the wall of separation. And it includes biometric uh, inf uh, equipment, equipment that collects biometric information from people. Uh, and this is something that uh, has been used on Palestinian workers who seek employment inside Israel. They have to carry biometric cards. And there are scanners that uh, um, are used so that the Palestinian workers will have to um, put the card and uh, check their, uh, show their fingerprint uh, every time they want to enter Israel. Um, and uh, Palestinian workers pay for those magnetic cards. And, so, and then these companies that produce these technologies want to sell them later. Some of that technology is actually software, not even hardware and include things like uh, data mining uh, programs. Programs that will go through very large databases and try to collect information. The whole NSA scandal that we are, that is now in the news, uh, is about collecting uh, information, for example, about calls that people make, or, uh, or emails. Well, if you want to have a program that will tell you who are the phone company numbers that somebody is calling most frequently, or at what dates exactly. These programs are, uh, sometimes are produced by Israeli uh, companies. And this homeland security industry is based again on the issue of prestige. And this is related to what, to what I said before. The fact that what the Israeli companies can do and other companies are not, cannot do so easily, Israeli com companies can say, we have already tried this on actual human beings. After the um, invasion of the uh, 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 and bombardment of Gaza in 2008-2009, known as the Cast Lead, um, there was immediately after the attack um, a show in which the army showed the new technology that they used in that attack. What kind of robots and cameras uh, they used, and then people could see that and buy it. And the attack against Gaza of last November. Um, of, of 2012, uh, was uh, one month afterward, the famous rockets, that uh, missiles that Israel developed to intercept the Qassam rockets from Gaza were uh, shown in a trade show in India and there, were already, uh, there was already interest by various countries to buy these missiles. So you can see that wars are, are gradually becoming a way to market products to market, and I think this is also really showing to us that the way that has been made, or the passage, from a kind of philosophy that says weapon companies are exist in order to provide the Israeli army with the tools it needs in order to win wars, to a kind of reality in which the Israeli army starts to undertake missions and operations in order to make sure that these weapons can find the market. And I don't think that at any point uh, there, is, there are Israeli generals who sit around the table and say, okay, we should attack Gaza now in order to increase the sale of this system or other. But what we do see is that those uh, uh, private companies have become embedded in the army in such a strong way that they are starting to influence the way that the army thinks. Um, and Elbit system, which, which systems which I talked about before, is maybe the best example because this company uh, is uh, now the biggest private company in Israel and has so many branches and so many operations. It produces the helmets for the pilots of the US Air Force, so now it also has good connections in the United States. And um, the, the CEO of the company has said, we are going to develop weapons uh, that will be able to um, to eliminate the enemy before we, the enemy has a chance to show that they are the enemy. And 
you may, this comment you can think about a little bit what, what it means exactly. Does it mean that they're going to kill children because maybe they will grow up to be enemies? Does it mean that they are going to uh, kill people in their sleep? Um, and uh, because of, uh, they are suspected, these things have already happened. Uh, but uh, the Israeli government uh, is a bit equivocal about taking responsibility or acknowledging that these people were killed for these reasons, although there is proof. But when the company is developing this kind of technology inside the army itself, and as they are developing the technology, they are training the soldiers, and as they are training the soldiers, the soldiers know that after their military service they can get a job in this company and make a lot of money. And the company is saying, well, we have this new system, but we haven't tested it. We don't know if it works. Then the soldier has a certain dilemma. Um, so this issue, this issue of, of homeland security is very critical. And uh, I think uh, th there's a lot of economic data that we can look at uh, the last uh, 30 or 40 years, and we see that all around the world, there is more inequality than there was before. Inequality is rising around the world. This is not a localized phenomenon, but a global phenomenon. And uh, in some areas, uh, there are the inequality reaches extreme levels in which the government itself starts to look at some of its own population as unwanted, excess population. Uh, a good example of this uh, uh, is India, Israel's biggest weapons uh, customer, uh, and also Brazil, where the favelas, the very uh, poor neighborhoods, uh, are uh, seen by the government itself of Brazil as sort of hostile territories that they don't really like. They, they're not looking to um, rehabilitate these neighborhoods or to give the people who live there a better education and a chance to get a job. They're looking on how to isolate these communities in order so that in order so people will come to the World Cup events in Brazil and will not know that there are also poor people in this uh, city that, that don't have enough to eat. And the way that they do that is they make uh, uh, deals with Israeli companies like Elbit Systems and they copy Israeli, uh, Israeli methods and policies, like for example checkpoints. There are checkpoints in Rio de Janeiro around uh, enclosing these favelas and there are drones, unmanned drones, flying over the favelas and uh, surveying these neighborhoods. And this is a policy of containment. So the enemy is no longer an army. There is no army in the favelas. The enemy is civilians. And the best experts in repressing civilians are Israel or the Israeli companies. They are, they are renowned for that kind of technology and these are the companies that are able to operate in these areas. It doesn't always work so well because it, that sometimes uh, we see that there is a certain misunderstanding between the difference be between armies and civilians. Maybe a good example is um, Gal Hirsch, a very uh, famous Israeli officer who was in charge of the northern part of the Israeli army during the war uh, against Lebanon in 2006. This war was, from the Israeli point of view, a complete failure, uh, mainly because the Hezbollah was, was fighting better than the Palestinians. They were actually using uh, military uh, methods and not just uh, uh, protesting, and the Israeli soldiers didn't really know what to do about that. Uh, and uh, Gal Hirsch uh, was, was denounced in Israel and his, his military career was destroyed. So he left the army and founded his own arms company, like many others do. And then he went uh, to Georgia. And he, as, as a, military, a former senior military officer who has his own military com a company, a military in, a trade company, offered the Georgian government to buy Israeli technology. And the Georgian government was so impressed, they believed that Israeli technology would be able to stop the Russian army. And we know what happened in 2008. And, and, and we know that uh, uh, the Israeli technology was not intended to fight an army and was not successful, of course. Maybe if the Russians would come with uh, posters and megaphones, it would have been more effective. But uh, Because this is really what the Israeli army is trained in fighting. And, and so what we see now is that, and this leads me to the final point, uh, but, uh, which, which is why this is also interesting for us. But I'm going to 
take a little detour for, for 10 minutes or so and try to talk a little bit about the Israeli society side of things. Because I don't want to create the impression that Israel has become a, a weapons company. Israel is probably the most militarized society in the world. But even as the most militarized society in the world, it is mostly non-militarized. And even though there are some people who make a very large profit from, from the arms industry, the majority of Israeli people don't benefit from it. They are in fact suffering from it. So when we talk about who profits from, from the wars, who profits from the occupation, we should, we should talk about these people who profit, mainly those big companies, people like Ehud Barak, the former uh, uh, Prime Minister and former Minister of Defense, he is a very good friend of the CEO of Elbit Systems, and he just uh, said before the last elections that he's retiring from politics and going to do what he lo loves doing, which is business. And because he is the same min Minister of Defense who commanded the attack against Gaza in 2008-2009, and then again in 2012, he is now uh, in a position to make a lot of money. So there are people who profit from it, but the vast majority of the Israeli population does not profit from it. The cost of the security apparatus in Israel, the security organizations in Israel, is staggering. And it is higher than in any other country in the world in proportion to the gross domestic product, to GDP. No other country spends so much on GDP on security. According to official numbers, Israel is not number one, but number six in gross GDP per a, a cost, because uh, the, these official numbers don't take into account the fact that Israeli soldiers who are doing their uh, obligatory service are not paid, and their time is still worth something, but this time is not measured, and that almost 50% of the land of Israel is controlled directly or indirectly by the Ministry of Defense and not used for civilian and commercial purposes, but instead used as training grounds, military bases, and so on. So, uh, this is, when you take these things into account, it becomes clear why the Israeli economy is also in a state of collapse. I assume that you've all heard about the summer protests in the last two summers in Israel, uh, the tent protests uh, of people who are not able to afford decent housing anymore, and the poverty rate in Israel continues to increase. In fact, Israel uh, um, has, is now the country with the highest poverty rate in the OECD. OECD is the Organization of Developed Countries. Um, so there's more poverty in Israel than in Mexico and in Poland. And this is only counting Israel, only Israeli citizens. What we should really be counting is the whole population that lives <coughs> under the rule of the Israeli government. It's a population of 12 million people not 8 million citizens, but 12 million people, 4 million of them are not citizens. And of course, if we take that into account, then Israel is by no measure a developed economy at all. So the cost of security is quite high. One of the things that it, uh, it causes is the fact that a lot of Israelis lose interest in the national project. Maybe their political opinions continue to be right-wing, and you can see how they vote in the, from, from the elections, there is no change. but. The, but on the other, at, at the same time, the number of Israelis who go to the army we, it, it drops every year. In fact, uh, the number of Israelis that are now conscripted every year is only 48% of the citizens of Israel. 48%. So, 52% are not conscripted. There are many ways to avoid conscription. And officially, everybody is supposed to be conscripted. And in, in practice, it's only it's less than half. So, this means the army has less, so fewer soldiers. And with fewer soldiers, they're trying to find solutions. They don't want to try to, con to, to force those 52% to go into the army because they're not going to be very motivated soldiers. These are young Israelis who are either poorly educated or not interested in military service and they will not be very effective soldiers. So the solution is to develop unmanned system, systems. To, to privatize the checkpoints. You should know all of the checkpoints around Gaza and in the West Bank that the big checkpoints have been privatized. They are now operated by private companies. Um, and the use, uh, there are not enough pilots, so they're using the drones. There are not enough 
uh, uh, soldiers to patrol the wall of separation, so they're using cameras. So these technologies are also labor-saving technologies, and as such, they're also very interesting for uh, Western governments who want to conduct wars in some faraway place, maybe in Afghanistan, but they don't want all the political problems of having soldiers testify about what they saw in Afghanistan, what they did in Afghanistan. Well, if you use a robot instead, then you don't have to worry about these things, and Israel is indeed producing a lot of these robots, so that you can do the same with fewer soldiers. So even as the society becomes weaker and more divided and more dis disintegrated, this increases the incentive of the weapon companies to produce more products that are used to, to, instead of soldiers. Nevertheless, the costs are, are not worth it. So, overall, the Israeli economy is, is a, 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 a very uh, clear deteriorating trend. So, but, but having said that, and I think it's important to say that, the occupation expense is expensive, and we should not expect the Israeli public itself to be the ones who will end occupation. We should not expect that uh, one day the Israelis will wake up and see the terrible mistake that they've made. That's not how history works, unfortunately. We have to ask ourselves a little bit about what is our role as internationals, and, and as people from, from all around the world, why should we care? What can we do and what should we do about this uh, uh, very militarized state in, in Palestine which is using so much violence and violating human rights? And this brings me to the point where I want to say um, that I don't know if this, this will sound controversial to you, but I don't think that political activism comes from the position where we like Palestinians, or we, but in particular. It's not that Palestinians are any more worthy of, of equal rights and respect and dignity than any other people in the world. But it's because the, what is happening in Israel and Palestine is a symbol for a, a global question about what are the limits of, uh, of governments and armies and police uh, when it comes to violating uh, the right, the civil rights, and the, the private, uh, the privacy and, and the individual uh, dignity of, of citizens or, or civilians all over the world, and what we can see uh, very clearly is that whenever there is, um, whenever the Israeli-Palestinian, uh, I don't want to say Israeli-Palestinian conflict because it sounds as if these are two equal parts fighting against each other, and that's not the case, of course. Um, but, uh, but what we do see is, is uh, colonialism in Palestine, and whenever it is discussed, whenever there is um, a news debate about it or, or political debate about it, it comes within the context, the local context, of whoever happens to speak about it. And it is also part of the question about the war in Iraq, or the invasion of Iraq of 2003 or about what is the uh, Brazilian government allowed to do to its own citizens in Rio de Janeiro in preparation of the, uh, for the World Cup Games, or what is the Indian government allowed to do to its own citizens or in Kashmir uh, using this technology. And if we look at the divide, the so-called left-right divide that we see so often in, uh, in North America and Europe especially, uh, we see very consistent that right-wing parties tend to be pro-Israel, left-wing parties tend to be pro-Palestinian. And it's not a coincidence, it's not a mistake, because the, the, when we see people like uh, Berlusconi in Italy, one of the big friends of Israel, who uh, allowed Israel, or invited Israel, to become part of the OECD, to, to, to join the OECD. Why did Berlusconi work so hard to have Israel join the OECD? It's something that Israel wanted, but what, why does Berlusconi care? It's not because he's a Zionist, but he, because Berlusconi has certain policies against immigrants and against Muslims that he's interested in promoting inside Italy, against asylum seekers coming from Africa, and in order to promote these policies, he uses Israel as a role model. He says, look at what Israel is doing to immigrants, 
look at what Israel is doing to asylum seekers or to um, minorities that Israel is not, uh, uh, the government is not happy about, we should do the same thing in Italy. And if Israel is considered to be a legitimate country which is uh, respected and, and loved, then Italy can do the same. And therefore, it's not a struggle of us here in uh, Vienna thinking about how we can help Palestinians in the West Bank. It's a struggle about also what kind of future we want to live in in Vienna. So, I think uh, uh, maybe this is a good point to stop. I've spoken for about an hour. And, and I'll let you uh, ask questions. <laughs> I want to thank you so much for a really excellent talk. I think it was just fascinating. And um, we will open for questions. I would like to say one thing which is very indirectly concerned with your talk. I forgot to mention it. We have a petition. Our group has been very, very active about the blockade of the Gaza Strip. And we are trying to um, collect signatures to open the Rafah border. There is a connection between the e Egyptian government and the Israeli government, and there is a brutal block blockade, probably the worst it has been in many, many years. And one should not forget that there are 800,000 children in Gaza who are not getting proper food, education, who are living under the threat of, of dying, actually. And I would, we have, I think we have a laptop. If people, there is a, a petition which is being circulated by Avaz. And we also have the leaflets if you want to do that at home, if you are interested in trying to support this movement to open the Rafa border. It is inconceivable that this blockade should be allowed by the world to continue. So I just wanted to say that. And now we will open. For questions. In this event, could you explain how what you have said about the military aid to Israel? How does this apply to the military aid of America to Egypt? Yeah, okay, so um, first of all, I just wanted to thank Paula for uh, uh, reminding me that I actually told you half an argument, I, I didn't say the other half. Uh, when I said that uh, governments in, uh, in Brazil or India are trying to contain unwanted population, what I should have said at the end of that sentence is, and Gaza is the example of how this is done, the, the, the paradigmatic example that Israel is selling to the world, uh, not just to, to uh, Brazil and India, but also to the Palestinians in the West Bank. If you don't behave yourself, you're, you will be like this in Gaza. Uh, but to answer your question about uh, uh, the military aid. So Israel is the biggest recipient of aid from the United States in the world. Number two is Egypt. And that's quite interesting uh, considering the fact that Egypt uh, doesn't have enemies. So uh, the aid to Egypt was not as, as successful in creating sales to the US uh, uh, arms industry as it was uh, to Israel because it, Egypt doesn't uh, fight wars with its neighbors, as opposed to, to Israel. Um, nevertheless, of course, uh, uh, through that aid, the United States has a lot of influence on what is happening in Egypt about the army, and now that the army is taken over, then it's a very good example of what this influence actually means. Um, and it, it, the aid to Egypt, unlike the aid to Israel, comes in a, a two-component two uh, system where as long as Egypt continues to receive military aid from the United States, they are expected to buy wheat from the United States. And so it's more of a subsidy to the wheat industry than to the arms industry. And here, weapons are used more as, a, as an incentive, uh, which also makes it, made it very easier, much easier for Mubarak to control his own population, because obviously Having no enemies, you can only imagine what he needed so much, so many weapons for. Um, now that Mubarak is no longer in the picture, then there is a, a 
an uncertainty about what role this uh, aid plays in the in the future. And under U.S. law, it is legal for them to uh, give arms a, a, a arms aid to give weapons to countries that had a coup. And so you would expect them to stop. But the fact that they didn't stop, and the fact that they tried not to call it a coup for, for many months has a lot to do with the fact that the weapons lobby in the United States is very strong. Maybe Egypt is not paying for the weapons coming from the United States, but somebody is paying for them. And the weapon industry doesn't want to give up this very important uh, customer. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, presentation. You gave us a lot of uh, food for thought. And uh, I have three comments, not necessarily uh, questions. The first one is uh, what I gather from your presentation is that the struggle for the liberation of, of Palestine or the Palestinian occupied territories is not necessarily a local one, it is a globalized struggle. And this is, I think, what you meant in your last uh, comment that. Uh, the struggle and support for Palestine is not just for the sake of Palestinians, but to the sake of the world in, in general. The second comment is, you said don't expect the Israelis to wake up and demand ending occupation. I think the Israelis will wake up and demand ending occupation only if the, if the price of occupation has been increased. Uh, you see, the clerk did not wake up one day and thought he had a bad conscience about apartheid and he thought, I have to end it. He came to this conclusion because he realized, because of the international solidarity movement, the apartheid system cannot be sustained anymore. And that's why in our struggle for independence, we have to make occupation very costly for the Israelis so that the Israeli population will realize that this occupation cannot be sustained economically, even sometimes security-wise, cannot be uh, sustained. The third comment is the issue of privatization, which is something that is not only taking place in the military industry, this is a general phenomenon in the neoliberal neo school of thought, economic school of, uh, of thought. We've been seeing this on a variety of, uh, of levels. I'm thinking about the uh, car lobbies in Germany, uh, the fact that Germany in the last EU meeting blocked a resolution of the European Commission to decrease CO2 emissions for the cars industry in uh, Germany. This is an example of uh, privatization getting into a wild sort of capitalism. Now, it becomes even more dangerous when we are talking about military industry. Privatizing military industry and losing government control over these privatized uh, industries. I think this is the, the essence of the problem in the economies of, of, of today, is that you privatize, but at the same time, you lose government uh, control. This has also led to the financial crash in the international uh, markets because you left banks to do what, whatever they wanted to do without proper uh, government control. And it is even much worse when it comes to uh, military industry. So again, this re-emphasizes the point that you raised that I think the struggle today is very much uh, globalized that it has to be a struggle at the essence of the problem, which is the essence of the world economic order of today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for, for this uh, comment, uh, Mr. Shafin. I think uh, these are, uh, uh, I completely uh, agree, but I, I just like to, to continue these comments and say, um, when it comes to the issue of, of uh, convincing the Israelis through increasing the price, I, uh, uh, of course, uh, think this is very important and that, that's why I support the BDS movement for worker divestment sanctions 
And, but I think that it is a, the, the struggle of Palestinian freedom, it is a global struggle, but it is also the struggle of Palestinians. The Palestinians are the ones who will, uh, will win their own freedom and not because somebody will save them from outside. And the example that you gave of South Africa is a great example because uh, uh, there, there is a lot of debate how much the boycott movement against apartheid South Africa contributed to the end of apartheid. Was it a deciding factor or not? There are many questions about this. But uh, of course, the clerk's uh, uh, position about ending apartheid was a pragmatic decision. He felt that he could no longer sustain it, and therefore he had to let it go. The interesting thing is that after apartheid was uh, was destroyed, uh, well, was cancelled, then the vast majority of the white population in South Africa suddenly discover that they are against apartheid and they believe in equal rights for everyone. So the political change comes first, then the ideolo ideological change comes next. But the issue of privatization uh, that you, you mentioned is, is also very important and I hope that what I want to say now will not anger you too much. Uh, because I think uh, uh, one of the ways that the Israeli government like I said, deals with the fact that the cost is so high and they don't have enough soldiers, is to try to privatize or to outsource some of the security operations to private companies, or not just to private companies. From the point of view of the Israeli government, the South Lebanese army that uh, was used in South Lebanon was also privatization. They outsourced the operation of the occupation in South Lebanon to a, a, a different party, the South Lebanese army. And the uh, uh, creation of the Palestinian Authority is also a kind of outsourcing of, of occupation. This is what Yitzhak Rabin said in 1993, uh, sorry, 1992 to his own cabinet. He said, they will keep the order in the occupied territory for us so that we don't have to do it uh, with all the problems that we get from the human rights organizations and from the High Court. Now, I, I, of course, I, I don't think that the people who, who founded the, the Palestinian Authority or you, or you have uh, joined it in order to serve Israel, but I think it's very important to see from also to understand what was the Israeli logic to see the Palestinian Authority as a continuation of their own forces, but without using Israeli soldiers. But thanks. Yeah. Any questions? That was the same with the homelands in South Africa. The Palestinian Authority were used to control it. Yeah. I, I have a question that might sound a little bit exotic. My background is in Chinese studies, and a, a few years ago I was quite surprised when I discovered uh, a, a lack in my knowledge uh, when, when I realized that uh, China, that Israel was the second uh, biggest weapon supporter to China after Russia, and, and that there was quite a lot of trade going on between China and Israel. Can, can you say anything about that? And who are the other most important recipients, or the most important customers of, 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 of the Israeli weapons industry? You mentioned India. Yeah. Well, uh, Israel also uh, sells a lot of weapons to Taiwan. And uh, in this situation, uh, again, you can see how they are uh, uh, trying to, to profit from both sides. Regarding China, China is, is a very rapidly growing market and uh, the uh, demand for uh, weapons and, and security products is increasing very much. Israel wanted a share of that, but in that point they came into conflict with the United States a few times. Uh, and at one point they had to cancel an already signed deal to, su to sell a spy plane to uh, uh, China. And is, is the Israeli company who signed the deal had to pay compensations to China uh, for many billions of dollars uh, because, because they couldn't provide a plane because the United States uh, said this plane contains U.S. technology. Mm -hmm. And this is very important because through I think the United States is somewhat concerned about how much uh, power China uh, accumulates, also in terms of military power. Israel is not so much concerned, Israel is more, the Israeli companies are more concerned about selling, but they are restricted. So they can sell to China, but uh, not every component that they would like. Uh, and so I think that's mainly, that's one of the reasons why China is not the biggest customer of uh, uh, Israel, and not even the next one after India, there are others, like Brazil, Poland, uh, Azerbaijan, who, who buy more weapons than China. Um, this, these are estimates. I don't have the full numbers because, of course, these numbers are secret. 
What is interesting, maybe just as an anecdote, is that uh, one of the first products that the Israeli weapon industry sold was the Uzi, uh, the submachine gun, which used to be the main gun of the Israeli army, but it's more a gun good for, uh, useful for terrorist organizations, because it's small, but it's not really an open field war weapon. And today Israel is not selling it anymore, but China is. China is now the only country that sells the Uzi, or pr still produces it. Yeah. Um, yeah, you have a question? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. Uh, when you mentioned the example with uh, Brazil and that we should be concerned in general about how uh, not, or, or you know, how Palestine serves as a bad example for how to solve conflicts and that therefore we should be concerned. I was kind of missing something. I could, I just, you know, I could not imagine that the government of Lula now, Dilma Rousseff, would do anything such, anything hor that horrible to their own people. Uh, even if they have all the Israeli weapons in the world, they wouldn't do such a thing, right? Mm -hmm. To their own people, right? There has to be another component as well that is some kind of ideology that legitimizes violence against their own people. And, um, I don't know if you would like to develop yeah. a little bit on this side because maybe well, that's also yeah. our our role here when we're uh, when we're coming to hear about the occupation and so on that we should be aware of the of the role of ideology and so on. Thank you. Well, I think I think we cannot uh, boil down any kind of government into one person or into one ideology. These things are, are of course a bit more complicated because also in Brazil you have. The, the army and the police and, uh, when, and the, the ministries and they each push in their own uh, direction and they have also internal discussions and I'm not an expert on Brazilian politics but I, uh, I think it was Mark Twain who said uh, somebody holding a hammer sees every problem as a name and if you um, if these uh, we do know that the Brazilian senior police and military uh, go to Israel to receive training or have Israelis come to Brazil to provide training and during that, those training sessions they learn about Israeli methods such as using checkpoints and there are already checkpoints and they also learn about the kind of technologies and products that the Israeli army, uh, the Israeli military industry can provide if they convince the Brazilian government to buy some of these components and now they have the components then they've already made the first step, or maybe the most important step, towards also legitimizing the use of these weapons. So maybe at first they say, we're, we're only going to use these methods in times of, of uh, emergency, or, or if there will be no other choice. But when they have the weapon in their hands, there is really a risk that somebody will use them. And, uh, what we, and, and I think that's, that there's a kind of uh, uh, logic to this, which is in the, the United States uh, was called mission creep in reference to, to the war in uh, Iraq, for example, where you start with a certain objective, but after you implement the mechanisms to obtain that ob objective, the mechanisms start to have to create their own objectives. You start to maintain the mechanisms. You start to send soldiers to protect your mechanisms or your, your uh, bases that were intended to get something else, and you get drawn into this. And, and, in, the, and in Europe, for example, there is a plan to use drones that will fly over Europe skies. Now the uh, Union of um, Sky Controllers, the ones who are uh, making sure that airplanes don't crash with each other, are not very uh, are very much against the idea that there will be unmanned drones in the sky that could collide with airplanes. But when but but we know that that most European countries are buying drones from Israel. We know that. The question is, will they just keep these drones in the basement, or will they eventually be tempted to use them? And against whom? Austria, or Yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, I talked about right and left, and of course I think, uh, uh, I don't need to tell you about, about Schrafe, the uh, type of highlight, uh, uh, I'm sure you can tell me more, but you know that in Israel, there was a very a big news coverage of this, about how wonderful it is that this um, um, Austrian politician loves Israel so much and supports Israel. Yeah. And yes, maybe th this party has some dark past in it, but it's not important because now they will uh, convince Europe uh, not to support the boycott and to uh, 
uh, not to, uh, and to uh, recognize the occupation and so on. Yeah. I'm going to ask a very naive question. Um, part of the talk is the collaboration with Europe. And there is a struggle, it seems to me, about the territorial guidelines on settlement products. And it seems very likely, although there's been a, there are a lot of letters which have been sent to the European parliamentarians, that they might cave in on this. And I'm wondering why they always cave in to Israel. Do you have an opinion to give on this? Well, this is, this is a historical question. I think uh, it, it started with the, the European Council being built in such a way that it has to have um, decisions taken unanimously. And whenever there was a decision that was to criticize Israel or to sanction Israel, there would be at least one country that would vote against, which used to be Germany. It was always Germany who, who was too afraid to criticize Israel. But later that changed and it became the Netherlands and Czech, Czech Republic. Czech Republic, now the Netherlands had a very right wing government, now that maybe it's changed, we can only hope. Uh, but uh, Czech Republic is also one of the biggest a customer of weapons from Israel. So they see their partnership with Israel on a different level. And what we could see um, during the attack on Gaza in 2008 2009 is that Europe sent two delegations. There were two delegations from the European Union to Israel during that war. Um, I don't think we should call it a war because it was mostly one sided during this invasion. And one of them was Angela Merkel <coughs> and uh, Sarkozy. <coughs> And they came to maybe criticize Israel, but eventually they said nothing and came back to Europe without saying anything. The other uh, uh, was, was from Czech Republic, also representing the European Union, coming to support Israel in its right to defend itself. So it is infuriating. It is, uh, um, we see that Israel is putting a lot of efforts to buy friends in, in Europe by selling weapons or, or uh, by uh, investing in uh, changing opinions. The Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs has a massive budget to pay people to write talkbacks in uh, websites and things like that. Um, and, and they're supporting Israeli artists to go and appear around the world in order to uh, show how Israel is a wonderful and cultural place. But I do think that despite of all these efforts, there, there is a very clear direction that we can see, because these guidelines that you mentioned were actually, you could say, why are they new? The Europe has already had a policy not to recognize and not to support the occupation since 1967. Well, there was no European Union, but, uh, but each European country had these policies. Uh, and uh, so why, why are these guidelines such a big, diff uh, such a big change? And I think because for the first time, we see more and more politicians in Europe who are willing also to uh, be open about their uh, policies, to say that it's not enough to say that we don't support the occupation, we also have to do something to stop supporting the occupation. And also because the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs has used this argument that if you criticize Israel, you are an anti Semite so many times that people don't take it seriously. So in that case, I allow myself to be optimistic, and I think we are moving in the right direction. If we see the reaction inside Israel to these guidelines, it was a reaction, it still is a reaction, of complete panic. Mm -hmm. They know that if they cannot get a compromise on these guidelines, it is a disaster. Not because of the money involved, there is some money involved, about 300 million euros, uh, but they will spend 10 times of that money in order to, to change the guidelines because of the symbolic significance it has that Israel has to sign itself on a document that says that the territories are not part of Israel and they will not sign it and if they will not sign it they will start to lose their cooperation on many levels out of um, there are 28 research projects between Europe and Israel on the issue of security so if these projects will, will be lost and the Israeli security industry the, the arms company will lose a lot of business if you, yeah, oh, sorry, okay. um, could you uh, elaborate on, on contradictions within uh, the Israeli army and the military complex regarding Syria and Iran? Because it seems to me your argument is very much 
based on, on, on the idea that war is good for profit. But um, it seems to me like powerful forces within the army are very much opposed to intervention in Syria as well as Iran. Yeah, well, I should be very clear that war is not good for profit, but war is good for profit of certain companies and people, and only a certain kind of war. Netanyahu made Iran to be his big campaign issue, and he's, but this was very important for him. But the senior command of the Israeli army are not so keen on going to war against Iran, because Iran has an army, and it can defend itself. Um, and in, in fact, this is something very much connected with the submarines that uh, Germany is supplying to Israel. Because there was a debate inside the Israeli Air Force about what will happen if they will, go, if they will be asked to attack Iran. And they made a calculation that they will need about 25 bombers to go and attack Iran, and, and only five of them will come back. Then the Israeli pilots said, we're not interested in that. <laughs> so, they said, well, we cannot send planes, we have to send missiles. But the problem is that with a satellite, you can see exactly when the missile is being launched. You don't know where it will land, but you know exactly the moment that it is launched, so they can go into the bunker. Um, so they said, we need to, to launch the missile from the middle of the sea, where it is not observed by a satellite. So we need special submarines that have very big caliber um, tubes to send the missiles. And that's when Israel made the deal uh, to buy the uh, 12 submarines. So far, only six were actually provided, which is the most expensive weapon in the Israeli army, uh, in order to have the ability to attack Iran. And this is very interesting that the German government wants to provide Israel with the means to start a war against Iran. It's, I think uh, um, it shows that also the German government is influenced by the German military uh, industry. And, and Israel is not uh, the first country that invented this idea that the military industry can affect uh, politics, of course. Uh, so, no, of course, not all war is always uh, uh, something that the army would, would uh, support. And there are always debates about this, there are always discussions about this. In this case, because the war in Iran has been so associated, specifically with Netanyahu and his own personal career, then a lot of Israelis say, well, we don't really need it. And uh, regarding Syria, I mean, uh, it's also not quite clear what is the position of the Israeli army and uh, the Israeli government also. They're, they're quite afraid of this, of getting involved there. And nevertheless, the Israeli, uh, Israel has made about three attacks on Syria uh, in the past few months, one of them quite recent. And it makes one wonder, why are they making these attacks in Syria where it could draw Israel into uh, this, this war? Um, when it doesn't make a lot of sense for many reasons, but in, in, in all three of these attacks, the Israeli government didn't take responsibility. They didn't say, we attacked. But in one of those cases, they said, we didn't attack, but the missiles that were used for the attack were called uh, Spike and Popeye, and you can buy them from the Rafael company. <laughs> and I think that kind of answers the question. So, they, they wanted to, to advertise the missiles so badly, but they didn't take responsibility for the attack, but everybody knows that these missiles are produced by an Israeli company. Yeah, sorry, you were reading. Yeah? Um, you've, you've gone through many, many details, and so on, but you do sound, of the orders, that you're slightly optimistic. Do you see, what are the things that you see, the trends that you see is possibly going to cause real change in the near future? Or maybe not so near future, but you don't sound as though you're just looking at a, at a picture that's never going to alter itself. Yeah. Well, um, one of the things uh, that uh, yeah, uh, uh, Mr. Shafi said before that when the cost increases, the Israelis will open their eyes. But I, eco uh, um, economy is not like physics. You can never know exactly what is the turning point for a society. There is already an economic crisis in Israel. There are already a lot of Israelis who are leaving the country, especially educated Israelis, are leaving in very large numbers. Uh, if, if you go to Berlin, you can hear Hebrew on the on the uh, one. But um, and and there's also less fewer Israelis who go to the army. There's a lot of uh, um, talk inside the Israeli society about maybe time is running out. But what exactly is the moment? Nobody knows. The government, in in such a, a case, 
becomes more extreme and more right wing. And that's also not surprising because it was also the same situation in South Africa that before the collapse of apartheid, the government made a last effort to try to increase repression in order to, to save the regime. Um, I think uh, um, it, in, it's hard for me to predict what exactly is the moment, but, but we see that uh, the BDS movement is not just growing very fast, but it is also growing very fast in the minds of Israelis. So now every Israeli knows about BDS. Uh, especially thanks to a lot of uh, artists who, who made, made a stand and, and cancelled their performances in Israel. So a lot of Israelis become aware of this and it makes them think. And um, the, I, I, the reason I'm optimistic is because um, Israel is, is the last real apartheid regime in the world. There are many places in the world where there is racism and discrimination and inequality. But the regime of apartheid uh, exists really only in Israel. And, uh, but, but I do think that uh, the, the lacking component is a unified Palestinian struggle. As long as the Palestinian struggle is, is divided, there are currently, I would say, three main branches of the Palestinian struggle. And then it's very, uh, then also the Israelis don't know who to surrender to. I think when one of these three branches will become strong enough, then, then the, the Israeli government will have to surrender. They will have to recognize that everybody uh, has uh, equal rights. And of course I have my own preference which one of the three <laughs> branches should win, but, uh, but unfortunately that's not my choice. <coughs> yeah? Um, yeah. Any? Business uh, details uh, with the offer. Um, well, I, I don't know of anything worthy of, of mention. There are trade uh, uh, with all European countries, but specifically with Austria, there's nothing so so uh, important to mention. Maybe because Austria is also not a country involved in so many wars and. Uh, and Certainly compared to countries which are on the southern border of Europe, where using a lot of Israeli technology against uh, asylum seekers, um, or uh, countries with a more active military like Britain and France. Um, so Australia is not the most important uh, trading partner of Israel, but, um, but I, the, the problem is of course the kind of equipment, not the kind of equipment that is used to, to conquer new countries, but the kind of equipment that is used in the airport to, to do security checks, which gradually allows the government a lot of control and a lot of uh, invasive power over uh, civilians. And this kind of information in itself is a secret. So I think it's really up to, to you to find out uh, and, and protest against the use of such technologies against yourself. Can you say something about the security company, so-called security company G4S? Yeah. Yeah. And second, uh, what are the consequences for Israeli people to support BDS in their society? Yeah. Okay, G4S is a very good uh, um, example, a very interesting story. I will try to make it short. Um, this is a, a originally a Danish company that is now a Danish-British company claiming to be the biggest security company in the world with over 300,000 workers. And what is interesting about G4S is that they're, they try to present themselves as an ethical security company. They're not a mercenary army who, uh, operating in Africa and uh, toppling governments, but they're supposed to provide security mostly in the developed world. And uh, for, for companies, for, they, they provide security for the Olympics uh, in London. And uh, so, so they try to present themselves as a very ethic company, but they do have a problem with uh, the occupation. This is, uh, uh, it's not the only thing, now there's a, a, a trial against them in South Africa about uh, human rights violations. But uh, uh, the fact that they are providing security for an Israeli jail built illegally in the West Bank called the Offer Prison, uh, which is also a military court in which Miners are uh, charged and tried and, and incarcerated, uh, and the fact that they provide security for colonies, for checkpoints, is is very problematic. 
Now, because there was a, a campaign against them, they have toned down their activity, but they continue to operate in the offer prison. And they continue to provide equipment. So, and, and I looked at their financial reports and tried to, to understand from, from what I found uh, in, in various uh, uh, media sources, uh, for example, uh, mm -hmm. British media sources that talk about this company from a financial point of view. Why is it so important for this company to have a presence in Israel? If you look at their total income, their income from, from their operations in Israel and Palestine is less than 1%. This is a very big company, they could easily just close their branch. But the reason they don't do it, I believe, I don't have proof of this, I believe is that it's important for them to have a foothold in the country which is the, the capital of homeland security in the world. So that they can have Israeli workers who are former Israeli soldiers and police inside the company, not because they really bring some kind of expertise that nobody else has, but because they bring the prestige that comes with serving in Israeli military and police, and then if they deploy these uh, troops or, or these, these security guards, they will be able to get better contracts in other countries. So this is a, this is a company that has already lost some very important uh, um, contracts with the, the European Union, protecting the European Parliament and things like that, because they are violating international law. Uh, but uh, uh, they're willing to pay the price so far. At some point, I hope they will change their minds and realize that it's not a price worthy, worthwhile for them to pay. And we can look for, uh, at other companies like Veolia, uh, they've already decided it's not a price worthwhile for them to pay, and they try to, to leave. Uh, so, so there's also optimistic examples on this uh, kind of, of story. My question is about the Israeli-US uh, relations. You seem to imply that IPEC is not as important as most people think, and that there are economic reasons why. <coughs> but this doesn't really explain this bending backwards, not to criticize Israel at all. It goes beyond economic interest. Do you see any movement there changing? I mean, Europe seems to be optimistic about the chances of Latin America. Either you think it's not important as people think, but it is a key relationship. Yeah. And without you as pressure, it is not moving. Well, one of the things that, um, that have been discussed by US, even by US uh, uh, representatives, congresspeople and senators, is that if there is a congressperson or senator that speaks out against Israel, then there will be a big donation of money to their opponent, so they will lose their seat in the next election. So if you just take that at face value, it sounds like an anti-Semitic conspiracy. The question is, who is giving that money? Now, if you, there is a, a website um, which is, um, um, sh shows the, the lobby amounts of money that has to be, have to be registered in Washington, which organization has, how much, has given how much money in lobbying. And if you look at that website, you see that IMPACT is big. It has a budget of about three, thirteen million dollars every year. That's a lot of money. But when Lockheed Martin has sixty million dollars a year, and McDonnell Douglas and Boeing have more, then you realize that the people who are giving the money are not necessarily IPAC to the opponents of those representatives. I think IPAC is a symbol. It's much easier for U.S. politicians to to pretend to be uh, bending uh, over backwards not to criticize Israel, or to, to the, as a, in order to, to signal to their donors that they are loyal to the arms industry. But if they will, if they will say something else, then uh, they can get into trouble. Uh, and I think we, we see some interesting counterexamples like uh, Ron Paul, the, uh, uh, who, who is critical of the uh, arms trade to Israel, and he's not critical of Israel. So he's, he was willing to, to make that step and to say the US should stop giving Israel so many, so many weapons, and he got into trouble, of course, with the arms industry, and of course he, he will never be the candidate of the Republican Party to, to, for president, or at least not in the foreseeable future because of that. But, uh, but he identified this, this issue. He talks about it. And then and the question is, do we need uh, to see the 
US change its policy before we can see freedom in Palestine? I don't think so. I think the question is not whether the US will s suddenly change its opinion. The question is whether the, how much the US is willing to invest in order to keep uh, the, the apartheid situation and the colonization situation as it is. And I think this, the, the, question, the answer to this question is not so much. It's very cheap to, to speak, to, to, to say that they support Israel, but how much resources are they willing to invest? And the aid over the years have actually diminished in real terms. Like I said, $3 billion today is not $3 billion 40 years ago. So overall, the aid has become less, especially less than the total U.S. Uh, budget of, uh, of, the, of the State Department. And uh, in terms of, so, so the, the support of the U.S. becomes more and more just voting in the United Nations, vetoing any decision against Israel. This is, of course, very infuriating, it is very frustrating when, when the United States says we believe in the two-state solution, but we will vote, veto the two-state solution. Um, but I don't think that real decisions or, or real history is made in, in U.N. votes, it is made in Palestine, and if and I don't think if it comes to that that the United States will send its army to help Israel uh, crush the Palestinians. That's uh, I think a border they will not cross. And maybe, I, I hope I'm not wrong. Yeah, we think that there is a chance to have a light on the nuclear weapons uh, scenery in Israel by economic figures. Um, again, sorry. Yeah. Is it possible that to have a light, to have a view on the uh, nuclear weapons in Israel uh, by economic figures? Um, no, I, I don't know how you would go about finding that out in economic ways. We know there is a nuclear research facility in Israel, but do they have nuclear warheads? That's not really possible to know by looking at economic figures. And there is a very interesting debate about it about the Israeli nuclear ability and, and are there doubts about it and why are these doubts, where are these doubts coming from and the only uh, test, for example, that has been recorded of Israel's nuclear weapons was done in South Africa during the days of apartheid. The question is, did South Africa allow Israel to make this test over there? Um, and um, so, so, no, it's, it's really impossible to know exactly the, the truth, but I think that um, if we look at the scale that I try to, to portray between, on the one end, end we have those uh, 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 weapons of repression, like the handcuffs or the biometric uh, devices, where, which is what, what Israel needs and what Israel uses and what Israel develops, then the extreme other direction would be the nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons, I hope Israel doesn't have them or will disarm them if it has them or will never use them, but I think they are almost irrelevant because Israel doesn't have any enemy against which it, it might be conceivably relevant to use a nuclear weapon anyway. Iran? It, it, yeah, Iran, uh, uh, like I said, is, is very important for Netanyahu's political campaign, but Iran has never attacked Israel, has a smaller defense budget than Israel, has actually never attacked any country in the last 30 years. Uh, and it's, uh, I wouldn't call Iran a, a developed, a, 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 a progressive democracy, but, it's a, a, but in, if you're looking for countries that are a threat to their neighbors, then it's very strange that people are talking about Iran and not about Israel. Right? So, uh, okay. yeah. <laughs> I think we should close. Thank you. Thank you.